Uh, now let's move on to our second panel discussion for today. Now that's powered by China Daily and uh, credit to Silicon Dragon. This session will explore uh, the Asia's opportunity. Is Asia the world's new growth powerhouse? That's actually a question that a lot of us are wondering about. Now monitoring this panel is Mr. Albert Yip. He's the chairman of investment committee ITFA. And joining uh, the panel are, we have uh, Mr. Jeffrey Payne, founder, uh, sorry, founding partner of Golden Gate Ventures. We have Ms. Subun Ko, founder and managing partner for iGlobe Partners. We have Mr. Karim Mikirji, SVP and managing director in Tech Ventures. Last but not least, we have Mr. Alan Fung. He's a partner of Asia of Green Tech Fund. Now, I will pass uh, the floor to Albert. So, Albert, please. Thank you, MC. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Cyberforce Venture Capital Forum. Uh, thank you for joining the China Dairy Asia Leadership Forum. Um, I'm LB, the representative of IFTA and also the chairman as well as CEO of Syndicate Capital. Um, on my left, I have Mr. Alan Fung, partner of Asia Green Tech Fund, as well as a couple of the panelists coming in by video conferencing. Well, thank you for Jeffrey Payne, founding partners Golden Gate Ventures, Mr. Subban Ko, founder and managing partners, iGroup Partners, uh, Mr. Karim um, Haji, SVP and managing partner in Tech Ventures. Um, thank you to all of you accepting our invites to be our panelist. I would like to start with Jeff. Um, I like your caps, Jeff. All right. Jeff, I understand that you start and manage the founder institute in Singapore where you are currently overseeing the growth in Southeast Asia and Japan. Since 2010, uh, the founder institute in Singapore has graduated over 100 companies. Very, very impressive. I understand you also studied in LA, which is really close to Silicon Valley. Now, here come my questions. Um, Silicon Valley has always been seen as the breeding ground for unicorns uh, in the past decades. Nowadays, Southeast Asia is said to be the racing ahead to become the next Silicon Valley of the regions, which I mean the APAC regions. So what do you think and how do you see the tech startups ecosystem development trends in Asia 2021 and beyond, Jeff? Sure. Um, so first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, um, I think Southeast Asia um, is undergoing the second sort of the, the this is the second run. I think the first run was in the early 2000s. Second run was uh, somewhere from 2006, seven onwards. Um, if you are asking me, um, are there more unicorns since 2006? The answer is yes. Are there more capital? The answer is yes. Um, but ma the, the, the main reason is the, uh, the market adoption is for digital products and services are growing. Um, and the behavioral change is, uh, you know, is upon us. So that's, that's, that's the, real, the, the, you know, the, the real thing that's happening. Um, so are more things being changed, uh, more capital being looked at in Southeast Asia? Yes, a lot of money went to Singapore, Indonesia, and lately uh, a bit more in Vietnam. But if you're asking me, is there real clear-cut innovation happening in Southeast Asia? I think we are still a little bit um, behind. Um, there is there are some advances in Singapore um, and a little bit in Vietnam, but um, Predominantly, most most ideas here or most companies here are uh, copycat type ideas and derivative ideas, um, and there's nothing wrong with that. Right? It's just the way the ecosystems are growing, the way it's advancing. Um, and it, you can you can say that you know, similar in India in two thousand three and six. You can say that you know, obviously in China uh, from the late nineties. So. Are there more money? Yes. Are there more startups that are growing in value? Yes. And uh, are there more technical people, more people interested in startups, more you know, uh, uh, technical type founders growing in numbers? And the answer is yes. All right. Thank you, Jeff. How do you, how do you see um, the GBA in China? Because um, well, GBA in China is growing fast too, and some people see that. Well, as a Silicon Valley here in China, so what do you think? Um, Jeff, uh, you mind to share some insights with us? How do you see the greater base areas in mainland China? Oh, 
Um, yeah, the Great Bay Area, I, I, I do understand when my family's from Tongkwan. Um, and uh, I, I think it, 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 there is two things. There is the mainland China phenomena, and then there is the Hong Kong phenomena. So I think it's it's. I would say anything that's happening in the mainland has has been doing so for you know, probably twenty years already. Um, and then uh, what's been happening recently, uh, GBA as well as Hong Kong. Um, I think it's still early on. It's still early stage. But I think there's uh, there's definite uh, interesting sort of prospects looking all right. at it. Oh. All right, thank you, Jeff, and let's see um, well, how this goes. Um, so, um, Subun, it's always great to have women leader on the panel. Well, first speaking, I'm from time to time, I always bet uh, 50 50s. Um, well, it's good for you today um, to join us. So, Subun, you found iGroup in 1999 where the VC was experiencing the onset of globalizations. As a veteran in the global VC industry with specializations in technology investing, you have consistently achieved the top quartile fund return for investment and working alongside with some sizable VCs in such as um, Sequoia Capital, Tencent, across Hong Kong Jam Board, NASDAQ, as well as the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Now, you might to share some of your thoughts and insights with us. Um, during this couple, as you know, during this couple of years, well, the group, the whole world, is significantly impacted by uncertainties of China, U.S. relationships, and COVID-19. So how is the pandemic and trade war uh, that offer, it, do you think it, it offers great opportunities for Asia tech startups and investors? What do you think? So um, let me uh, comment a little bit about the trade war and the pandemic situation. So under the crowd of this uh, China-US trade war, Basically, you see a couple of things happening. One is the major move of foreign MNCs moving their manufacturing operation essentially from US, uh, from China to Southeast Asia. Yeah. And the biggest beneficiary, I would say, is Vietnam and Indonesia. So this is a big thing. Second thing, there's this, because of the regional trade, mm -hmm. you know, struggles, Japan, Korea, you know, Japan, China, <laughs> So, but I think Southeast Asia, uh, uh, fortunately, we are quite uh, not, we don't quarrel with our neighbors, right? So that's the positive thing. Right. So in fact, regulatory environments are actually very encouraging. Local startup and also local governments, respective country, are very supportive of tech entrepreneur, right? Yeah. The other thing is also local consumers are shifting towards local brands and also uh, avoiding less uh, kind of expensive foreign brands, right? So this is the phenomena resulting of the trade war. So no, now everybody is like, I'm just, you know, concerned about my people, the country and all that. The other thing is in the pandemic case, you know, it actually accelerated the adoption of digital transformation across the board of all the traditional industry. Plus, it actually slowed down for foreign competition to enter into Asia market, ASEAN market. So that actually has uh, give many of the, whether Singapore startup or Indonesian startup or Vietnamese startup uh, against foreign competition because first also people cannot travel, right? Mm -hmm. So where are the opportunities that we see that actually is happening across the board, particularly in the ASEAN countries? Uh, naturally, I think offline to online purchases actually accelerated this in, during this lockdown. So obviously, e-commerce and logistic grew substantially. Exactly. And of course, the supply chain is broken in China mm. and all places. And this is where Indonesia and the rest across the ASEAN countries actually start to grow. Another thing is the telehealth players establish its presence almost immediately. <laughs> in the past, you have to get government to endorse you. Now, government say, yeah, you know, by necessity, we'll just give you approval for anything, everything. That actually facilitate the distribution or, you know, uh, telemedicine platform. Another observation is, as you can see, the physical property market value actually collapsed within a couple of months. 
literally, right? At least one third of the wealth of the tycoons are gone. And I think that is not going to come back that quickly. Mm -hmm. We see the commercial malls activity are adversely compromised. Nobody can go. So I think that is going to change how we do our shopping in future. Office space is half empty because of the, you know, you have to work at home. And residential property normally is pretty stable. And that actually has prompted a new group of prop tech company coming up, right? The co-working space. I mean, we have investment in the great room. Uh, actually, they are not, many of the co-working space are not the way you work. So they have actually very different business model. And I think the style is happening. As we can see also the fintech industry, the banking industry is in, in the decline. That means the bankers also know, the traditional banks also know that um, over time, they may ha be firing 50% of their staff, but they would not know when. So they are already starting to plan to say that it's not a good idea to have one block of building with all your staff located in one place, you know, with this COVID situation. Right. So people are starting to plan to say, should I put my front end, certain part of my front end, actually in different kind of co-working space and then the back end do something very separately. So, so this um, pandemic situation has stopped people reset about how we are going to work in the future and the future of works actually that's very interesting. Right. Another uh, kind of uh, prop tech company which we have invested, which uh, a company called Metapod, essentially what they do is they capture the virtual tools for residential and commercial property. Right. And in fact, in the US, they are actually closing deals. You don't need real estate agent. And, you know, rental uh, tenants, they don't really actually need to look at the actual property. They just feel comfortable to just sign off and con complete the uh, whole transaction. All right. Well, thank you, Karim. The I think you mentioned a couple of, uh, well, key things like, um, well, I totally agree with your observations because I, I feel the same ways too and see the same trend. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things like the supply chain and distributions, which I do think you helped me to lead to another question to Kareem. Uh, Kareem, over your career at Intel, you have led leadership's roles in distributions, finance and corporate R&D. So uh, while you located back to Hong Kong last year, so you're also responsible for AI, R&D, and leading your company to invest in startups that engage in, well, disruptive technology. So with the new normal, well, just like what uh, Super mentioned, uh, as well as the digital innovation across all sectors, what are the booming tech sectors? For example, FinTech, just mentioned by Subun, and the key tech enablers in Asia, what's the investment opportunities um, to, to offer us? Um, well, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's important to kind of understand our context. As you uh, mentioned, I've been in, in Asia now for 14 months uh, representing uh, Intact, which is Canada's largest uh, home auto and business insurer. Uh, and really the investment lens that we look at is what's going to be disruptive, you know, to our industry from a long-term perspective. And, you know, I think generally within the areas that we're looking to invest, uh, COVID has definitely accelerated trends uh, rather than create uh, new trends. I think digital innovation, uh, you know, offline to online, et cetera, I think almost is, is table stakes at this point, but really what companies like us and others are thinking about is, you know, how do you digitize the entire customer journey? And there's a lot of pain points there, uh, I would say for incumbents um, that can learn from startups or to actually partner with startups as well. Uh, I think from a, a sector perspective, when we take a look at uh, investable opportunities uh, in Asia that match up with our investment thesis, obviously I think FinTech is, is definitely at the core of uh, what we're looking at. And I think when we, you know, think about FinTech, it's a very broad category, including, you know, the protection of assets, managing finances, uh, but also including the, you know, options for the underserved portion uh, of the market, which also includes insurance and insure tech. You know, I think we've learned that disrupting the entire value chain here uh, is quite uh, difficult, uh, but if you can actually attack uh, different points of the value chain, uh, there is a lot of appetite, especially with what you've seen in the West uh, around the public market uh, receptivity for growth companies such as uh, Lemonade and Root uh, over the last uh, six months as well. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I think Asia, quite honestly, from a, a FinTech perspective, uh, plays a very key role and, and they're further ahead than what you see uh, in the Western world in many respects. Um, mobility, I think, is one area that we're thinking about quite a bit. And I would say, you know, in mobility, we were more focused on the sharing economy as well as autonomous vehicles, which are still quite interesting. But I think, you know, uh, the movement of goods, logistics, supply chain, smart cities, mass transit, you know, all of these things from in a post-COVID world for me is, is very interesting in terms of how uh, Asia is approaching these angles and, and what we can learn out west as well. I think the third area uh, I'd identify is the impact on micro and small businesses. And uh, this, I think for me is um, not just an Asian phenomenon, uh, it's a global phenomenon, but I think what happens in Asia will be particularly interesting uh, in terms of ascertaining credits uh, or credit worthiness for, for micro or small businesses. Um, and from an insurance perspective, how do you protect these uh, businesses so that they can actually grow and develop? You know, we've seen in the past with different uh, economic downturns, the, the eventual boom uh, in terms of new business growth in the small community. And I think from a FinTech and innovation perspective, uh, supporting these businesses uh, is quite important. Right. Uh, I think, yeah, from an enabler perspective, again, maybe two areas to highlight in Asia. Uh, I think Asia clearly has a big advantage from a data perspective. And, um, you know, the digital first nature of Asian consumers allows a, a whole host of innovative solutions uh, to get created. So I think data and artificial intelligence is critical. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think the distribution angle around, you know, the high acquisition costs that many incumbents face uh, in terms of acquiring customers and the competition with super apps uh, in Asia is quite interesting. But how this all plays out from a B2B to C perspective, uh, including embedded products, I think is quite interesting uh, in the future as well. Yeah, okay, thank you, um, Kareem. Um, hi, Aaron. Sorry, I'll keeping you so long on the stage. Okay. You are an all-around financial expert with investment banking and corporate management background. I understand your Asia Green Tech Fund invest in green energy as well as the green technology as well in Asia and respond to climate change. Well, uh, nowadays everyone talk about climate change. And uh, well, it, it led to my questions, uh, which is a hot question too. Well, ESG investing in green finance have been seriously taken in North America and Europe during the past decades. Now, it also becomes the niche of many investors as well, fund house in Asia. Do you think Asia can catch up with the pace? What do you think? Actually, uh, I think Asia, uh, the green investing has been a, a, a hot topic and uh, I have been invited to join many uh, impact investment, green investment forum in the last 12 months. Mm. I think uh, it's because due to policy as well as technology uh, driven, uh, in terms of policy, uh, look at China. Uh, they have uh, announced plan that the uh, uh, renewable energy as a percentage of total energy uh, capacity to increase from 15% at the moment right. to more than double by 2035. Mm -hmm. It is a huge investment uh, uh, to to be have in, in the next uh, 15 years, and. Uh, for example, in Malaysia, where we have investment as well, they also have a very aggressive plan that the renewable energy percentage of total energy mix to increase from 3% last year right. to 20% yeah. by 2025 mm -hmm. is even more aggressive than the China uh, plan. So there are a lot of opportunities and capital required in terms of, for example, renewable energy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, another area, for example, electric vehicles, China announced another initiative yesterday that mm -hmm. uh, new energy vehicles as a percentage of new vehicle sales. Last year, it was about 5.6%. Yeah, I agree. And they have a plan to increase this to 20% by 2025. Wonderful. Okay, so it's a, I... it's a massive number, uh, yeah. uh, and, and we are talking about the uh, electric vehicles fleet in China mm -hmm. to reach uh, 18 million by two, uh, 2029. But the number has to be revised now because of the new initiative, a lot of uh, investment required, and also government policy to support this initiative. Right, right. And uh, green financing, for example, uh, green bonds. Mm -hmm. China has already got their own 
green bonds than the back to 2015. They tried to merge because uh, at that point of time, that, that uh, 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 policy uh, requirements actually set up by two organizations, PPOC and NDLC. They are going to merge because it, it is not 100% reconciled to the international standard, but they are going to merge it. Uh, if we look at the number, green bond uh, uh, size last year in China, we are talking about 57 billion US dollar. Okay. All right. That is uh, the policy front. If we're talking about the technology improvement, that helped uh, 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 the uh, uh, green uh, development. Look at solar panels. 10 years ago, if without government subsidies, it's not profitable. Mm -hmm. But now, because the solar uh, panel prices have been decreasing in the last uh, 10 years, now it's profitable, even without subsidies. Right, and okay. and that, that, that helps the whole industry. Uh, we have big data, so that's why we have been seeing a lot of, for example, agri-tech companies using big data. Uh, that we, we cannot imagine maybe five, uh, five years ago. Yeah, I see a lot of government is uh, providing support, not only in China, yeah. not on, only well, Asian well, governments supporting um, the new energy. Yeah. Uh, so for some of the Middle East, yeah. where they are greatly involved in traditional oil business, now shifting into the new energy too, all right? Well, I have a couple of questions, which is quite generic. Um, that I would like to invite to some of the comments and insights from the panelists here. Now, Asia has considered during the past decade, has considered as a driving engine for the global economic and growth in the past decade. Um, is it still the case? And how Asia will stand out or having competitive edge and lead the race in the new venture landscape? So, um, Zubon, do, do you want to share some of your insights with us? How do you see well, Asia in the coming uh, decade? Is it still the case that we stand out as having the competitive edge in leading the race? What do you think? Um, Super, I think you are on mute. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. I think the past 10-15 uh, years, we saw the rise of China um, and then now we are seeing the catching up of uh, ASEAN. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was telling my Japanese friend, they have kind of gone to sleep for the last 30 years, right? So now actually they have waken up. So if you look at um, even under the trade war and post-pandemic, um, post China will continue to do well. First, they have 1.4 billion population. They have a very large consumer base. Uh, today, they have uh, armed themselves with very good technology. In fact, they are even more advanced than the rest of in mean, US and Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, the payment is uh, all way in advance in the so-called fintech industry, right? All the, uh, you know, the WePay and Alipay and also semiconductor industry. So what they have to do is just, you know, to make sure that their population spend money, don't save money. So instead of export looking, now they actually build in, in port, uh, inward looking and they actually can, uh, can sustain that kind of growth. Whereas in, in the case of Japan and Korea, they are confronted with aging population for mm -hmm. a while already. They have actually advanced uh, technology as compared to ASEAN. So ASEAN become a natural hunting ground for them. And over the last 10, 15 years, if you observe, the Japanese, you know, the automakers and all that, actually already in Southeast Asia. Now, as uh, Jeffrey was talking about just now, that with the influx of uh, venture capital money and with the return of uh, perhaps... Um, you know, uh, technology people uh, who has H1 visa and then now maybe they don't feel so well coming in the US. Mm. Now you increase the intensity of the talent coming here. Right. And with a younger population in ASEAN, okay, I great. think that that is going to propel mm -hmm. uh, a very good bright spot for ASEAN and the Asia uh, landscape. Right, right. Thank you, Subon. It sounds very promising and uh, very positive uh, from your perspective. Um, Jeff, um, 
Well, you just mentioned, or right before you mentioned that uh, in some of the Asian countries, well, the technology is still the copycat, and I think uh, it's quite a little bit different from, um, from the real point of Subban, where she thinks that, well, the technology in Asia is becoming more advancing. So what do you think? Um, Jeff, how, how, how do you see, um, are we still, well, talking about Asia, are we still the driving engine for the, for the growth of, for the whole group from technology perspective? What do you think, Jeff? Um, uh, Asia, there are two types of Asia. There is the uh, developed Asia and uh, developing Asia. So I think developing mm -hmm. Asia, the good, the good, the good news is uh, the digital adoption is growing. Right. Uh, and then develop Asia, you know, just like Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Singapore. Um, you know, th there are more, more and more returnees. There are more and more better technology, more and more spin-outs. Right? The university research, uh, big, big company engineers leaving big companies, and starting startups. Mm -hmm. um, the stigma of uh, starting your own company is is becoming less and less, uh, you know, uh, uh, detrimental to, to 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 your social kind of life or social status. So it's becoming a bit more um, uh, trendy in some sense uh, to, mm -hmm. to start your own companies. So all this is going in the right direction. But okay. we just have to understand a few things. One is the timing of every country's growth is different the revenue potentials are also different mm -hmm. and then the different talent pools that are good in different things are also different in different countries okay. but right. it's on the right trend yeah. okay thank you well thank you for segmenting well asia into developing as well as undeveloping so it provides more in-depth insight from these two perspectives uh, i have the last questions sorry the time is overrun but i have the last questions because most of our, our audience came from hong kong and uh, well um I would like to ask both um, um, Kareem as well as Alan, um, what do you think about the Hong Kong startup potentials as well opportunities in the Asian market and innovation ecosystems? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've been here for 14 months and I've been, uh, you know, very happy with uh, the support that I've gotten in Hong Kong, both with, uh, you know, you're seeing the innovation in organizations like the Science Park and Cyberport, as well as, uh, you know, the government really supporting um, innovation in the in the fintech and prop tech sector in particular and i think you know from a historical perspective banking and prop tech has been uh you know the key for hong kong and uh, i think we've been seeing some some good effort uh in terms of artificial intelligence which is you know why we chose hong kong as our first um location to open mm -hmm. up our, our international lab we've gone from zero to 25 employees in the last six months we've just gotten a second office space uh, we're probably one of the few international companies growing and developing in hong kong uh, over the last 12 months. And, you know, I, I think I'm very optimistic about the future of Hong Kong, but I think we also need to think about how to make, you know, STEM type uh, businesses and research top of mind for kids as they're coming out of uh, high school programs. How do we actually uh, take the four of the top 100 universities to really mm -hmm. double down on STEM and AI type research? Uh, and then having these folks actually work with uh, top companies doing cutting edge research in AI. I think, you know, we have a, a handful in Hong Kong, but we need to attract more businesses here. And right. I think the ecosystem will develop over time mm -hmm. uh, if, if we're all committed to actually uh, investing uh, in the future of Hong Kong. But I, we're very optimistic. Thank you, Karim. Thank you for sharing your objective view based on, well, uh, as you just come uh, relocate uh, to Hong Kong, and thanks for your objective view. How about uh, Alan? You have been here for a long time. Yeah. What do you uh, think about Hong Kong? In Hong Kong, we have seen a lot of uh, interesting opportunities in the last 12 months, uh, uh, both in Cyberport and other area, uh, other places. And, and also, I think we can look beyond a little bit in the Greater Bay Area, because if we look at Greater Bay Area, it is 5% uh, of total population in China, but it contributes 11% of the GDP mm -hmm. and uh, there are very good uh, uh, companies in the Greater Bay Area. Uh, if we look at unicorns, there are four, 43 new unicorns in the Bay Area end of mm -hmm. last year, barely $1.1 trillion. And I have seen some uh, recently, for example, uh, in uh, uh, Huizhou, we, we have looked at the uh, agri-tech company. Uh, hydroponics as well as using big data for uh, 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 a an analyzing uh, uh, when to use more nutrition and also the spe right. spectrum. 
And in Zhongshan, we, we look at another opportunity. It started off uh, uh, as a prepaid card company, but because of, they have, of the one million members they have, they leverage off that one million members and expand into uh, online shopping, online games. Yeah. So there are many uh, opportunities in the area as well that we, we can look at. Well, wonderful, Alan. Well, I cannot cover well, so many information as well as variable well, comments from all the speakers over here. All of them are very addressing to the questions that are raised today. And thank you to Anne for the last part you mentioned about GBA because it's something that I want to contain here, but because of time limits, I cannot uh, well to overrun of the sessions. So thank you to all the panelists here as well as to all the audience here. I hand back the time to the MC. Thank you.